as just stated, my name is Nick Spano. I am a first time NASIS attendee and I am here to present some cartographic work that I've been getting into with my colleagues, Dr. Lisa White, who's the Director of Education and Outreach at the Museum of Paleontology, and Shane Loeffler, who is here back in the audience and a good friend of mine with the Polar Geospatial Center of the University of Minnesota. I would like to thank both of them for their extensive help and insights in developing this project, and especially more immediately, Shane, because my computer's cursor just disappeared right before the session just started, so I am very grateful to Shane for him offering his laptop for me to borrow to present this. <laughs> and with that, I'll get into a quote, getting into the background of this work by um, the zoologist Alfred Russell Wallace uh, in his book, The Geographical Distribution of Animals. He wrote, it is clear, therefore, that we are now in an altogether exceptional period of the Earth's history. We live in a zoologically impoverished world from which all the hugest and fiercest, strangest forms have recently disappeared. And the first part of this sentence pops up in a lot of different articles on Ice Age extinctions and rewilding and gets a sense of like, oh, hmm, interesting. But what a lot of people don't include is the second half of this sentence which says, and it is no doubt a much better world for us now that they have gone. <laughs> which also might ins instill some, hmm, eh, okay, well. Anyway, this idea of animals disappearing from Earth's surface has been known for quite some time. Especially the most prominent thing is that half of all large animals, that is animals more massive than 100 pounds, over the past 50 years, or excuse me, 50,000 years, have disappeared. This is not the Where the Wild Things Were project itself. Um, this is just a map to show a little bit of background for that, but I'll get into some notable examples of these disappearances and extinctions. To start, here in North America, up until about 11,000 years ago, we had a beaver the size of a black bear called Castoroides. The one in the image here is actually on display at the Science Museum of Minnesota, right across the river in St. Paul. So if you have some time, I highly encourage checking out their exhibit on that. Uh, fun fact, also along the Mississippi River here uh, in Hidden Falls Regional Park of St. Paul, there was a specimen that had an extremely bad day when a boulder from the falls receding from the Mississippi fell and crushed it. It is now preserved in perpetuity. Going down to South America, we had elephant-sized sloths up until about 11,000 years ago. They walked around on all fours, but sometimes could rear up on their hind limbs. Very interesting work was just published last year, showing in the northern Amazon some beautiful cave or um, outcrop, in this case, um, paintings of uh, the first known painting of one of these giant ground sloths has been made uh, available. Going over to Australia, up until about 40,000 years ago, there were evolutionary cousins of wombats the size of rhinos. Interestingly, there is a aboriginal myth of what's called the bunyip that is thought to maybe be a representation of these giant animals known as diprotodon that lived in at least in these mythological stories, uh, some of these oxbow lakes and wetland environments. In Africa, Europe, and Asia, the extinctions of large animals have not been as severe as these very pronounced continental scale extinctions otherwise, but there were some notable species that have been lost, including Megaloceros giganteus, the giant deer that was around from Ireland all the way to China up until about 8,000 years ago. It was 10 feet tall at the shoulder and had a 12 foot wide rack of antlers. There's also a cave painting in it alongside the very famous lions, oroxen, bison, horses, and other things in Lascaux in France. But here we see the giant deer painted dating back to about 17,000 years ago. Interestingly, all of these animals coincided with behaviorally modern humans, at least for some time. 
And what we can do with these occurrences through time is get at a primary objective of conservation biology, which is to describe biological diversity in order to conserve it. With a long-term perspective as available from the Ice Age to today, we can do two things. One, we can understand how ecosystems once were for setting restoration goals and getting at some philosophical questions of what restoration means in these deeper time contexts. And two, we can understand how ecosystems change over past broad spatiotemporal scales to provide context for the design of conservation management responses given anticipated future changes. To do so, or at least get at it through a cartographic lens, earlier this year we launched a pilot version of Where the Wild Things Were as an atlas of charismatic animal losses from the Ice Age all the way to today. So I will launch that here, wherever my cursor goes again, okay. I'll open the home page we have. Okay, and this is hosted through the University of California Museum of Paleontology's website. Here on the home page, we have the banner, a uh, nice image of some of these animals in what's now Spain, a little bit of background description text, and an animated GIF showing some exploration through the ArcGIS story map we have featured on American lions, which for reference, American lions were anatomically just like modern lions, but about 25 to 40% bigger, and lived in North and South America during the Ice Age. And scrolling down the page, we have hyperlinks to each of these ArcGIS story maps for the species we have featured so far. We're starting out with this pilot version, intentionally using ArcGIS story maps to use this point and click build interface to really get it up and going. And we are focusing on animals just in the United States for now, assuming that the primary audience who's gonna be visiting the page will be US based. We also have links at the bottom of the page describing a bit of who the team is and importantly for thinking about the information behind this cartographic resource, where we get these um, findings from. Oh, whoops. And a dictionary definition of that. Okay, so we have really been pulling from a couple different data sources including the Global Biodiversity Informatics Facility, or Information Facility, excuse me, uh, Wikipedia, we've been going to as just kind of a first reference and then diving into the resources cited on these Wikipedia pages and diving into the scientific materials a bit more deeply. The paleobiology database, which uh, features not just large charismatic vertebrates, but um, taxa from across the domain of life. The International Union for Conservation of Nature's Red List, which is the global authority on defining which species are threatened and endangered and the Neotoma Paleoecology Database, which really focuses on about the past two and a half million years of life on Earth. So getting back to exploring some of whoops, these story maps. Let's see here, there we go. So I'm gonna do a very rough poll we have Five species in the pilot version so far. We're gonna call number one, jaguars. Number two, uh, saber-toothed cats. Number three, the American lions, as mentioned before. Number four, woolly mammoths. And number five, an evolutionary cousin to woolly mammoths known as the Colombian mammoth, which was similar to woolly mammoths, but less woolly and lived in more southerly and westerly North America. So I'll ask for a show of hands with the number corresponding to the species you're interested on your hand, and we will explore that. So we got, okay, and it's gonna be extremely rough because I can't count that quickly. <laughs> but, okay. Oh, man, okay. <laughs> We're interested in all of them, that's great. Okay, let's go with, all right, I saw, Oh, a lot of number threes out there, so we will dive into the lions here. Okay. And for all of these, we kind of follow a standard approach of introducing the species, giving this natural history background information, then diving into some of these specific localities to connect the user through a sense of, of place, and then we get into extinction hypotheses per each species and get at a uh, sense of 
okay, what about the living analogs or what about living lions or what are some conservation concerns facing uh, other species today? So with American lions, we have a little bit of a description here. We have a, um, a pelt from the head of an American lion that was found in South America to really try to get that hook to say, wow, that's amazing that that has been preserved over thousands of years. We have here highlighted a cave painting of what is thought to be an American lion from South America. And then we get into, oh, excuse me, some of these localities that the GIF from before was showing. So the user can say, expand this to full screen and say, okay, maybe I live near Los Angeles and I'm interested, okay, what's going on over here? And I can say, oh, wow, they, I didn't know that there were lions in what's now, oh, excuse me, read more, downtown Los Angeles that have been found at the Rancho La Brea Tar Pits. And we include with all of these points of interest hyperlinks for users to dive in for more information or um, some localities including near Las, um, Las Vegas, on the East Coast a little bit, in South Carolina, and so forth. Okay, and then we scroll into some more um, natural history information for American lions here, about how they relate morphologically to these other large cats, how they relate to living lions, a bit through their behaviors, and a bit through how maybe they were um, different in size between males and females and how we get at that information. And then we get, like I was talking about earlier, at this extinction hypothesis information and really try to provide a critical scientific context to say a lot of these ideas aren't really set in stone, especially on a species by species level. So then we make what we hope is the logical next question um, clear, which is, okay, well, what about modern lines? What about them? I've maybe heard some things about um, threats facing them. So this is a map showing um, uh, some files I found on where lines can be found in Africa today and where they recently have been found in yellow for where they are, brown where they've uh, recently disappeared from, and then a broader scale map looking historically at African lions, Panthera leo, and their Asiatic um, forms as well, getting at the fact that there were lions in Greece or there were lions spanning across the Arabian Peninsula at one time. Then we provide a little um, ending information here on how users can dive into more information on American lions. And then lastly, we provide information for users to um, get into some of these conservation concerns, what different groups are doing and how they can become involved with that. Now getting back to the slide here. So my background again isn't as much in cartography, but I've been teaching myself a bit through this um, GitHub workbook on web mapping that has been extremely helpful. And I definitely like to dive into some tools like Leaflet and D3 to make the Atlas more immersive, more interactive, and more engaging. So with that, we hope to instill a sense of awe that really gets at the heart of this project, which is, wow, that is wild. <laughs> and this is a passion project of mine at the moment, but I would love to turn it into a full-time position to really share these stories much more widely. And with that, I highly encourage you all to please explore here if you have your phones and would like to scan the QR code to dive into the Atlas that's available. Otherwise, I'll be sharing these slides on Slack. And we, it looks like we have a little bit of time for questions. I'm happy to address, and I thank you so much for your time. I think we have a minute and 30 seconds for questions, so. Yes. Hi, you specifically mentioned charismatic creatures. Are there any that you're like, no, we're not gonna do that? <laughs> that is a excellent question. And so charismatic in a loose sense means, say, 
large and well known, but the quantitative approach we're taking for which animals we're picking comes from a paper pub, excuse me, paper published in PLOS One that quantitatively ranked the most charismatic animals based on Disney and Pixar data sets and a sentiment analysis with that. <laughs> So like number one is tigers, number two is lions, and so forth. Um, koalas made that list, and so if there was any I wouldn't include, maybe koalas might get dropped off of there. Um, but if there's enough support, I'm definitely happy to dive into the history geographically of koalas. Thank you, Nick. If you have more questions, please post it on Slack.